Welcome to a public forum on a century of critical theory, the legacy of Georg Lukacs, hosted by Platypus. The Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old left, 1920s to 30s, new left, 1960s to 70s, and post-political left, 1980s to 90s for the possibility of emancipatory politics today. You can learn more about our activities or find a chapter local to you by visiting our website, platypus1917.org, or by emailing platypusvirtual at gmail.com. For those of you who are local, the Chicago's Chapters Reading Group is held Sundays in Harper 135 from 12 to 3 p.m. Coffee breaks are on Wednesdays, Hutchinson Commons, from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. If you're interested, please contact platypus.chicago at gmail.com. I will now read the panel descriptions that we circulated to our panelists, and then I will introduce our speakers. And this is the panel description. Strange as it is to reconsider Georg Lukacs today, after the demise of the Bolshevik experiment with which he was associated, the centenary marking the publication of his magnum opus, History and Class Consciousness, Studies in Marxist Dialectics, from 1923, offers the occasion to ask, what is the meaning of Lukács in history and class consciousness today? Over the last 100 years, various claims have been made of history and class consciousness. On the one hand, it is said to have inaugurated Western Marxism and set the foundation for the critical theory of the Frankfurt School. On the other, people have accused it of giving philosophical justifications for terroristic or opportunistic tendencies within Marxism-Leninism. We ask our panelists to consider the following. What is the relationship between political practice and theory that Lukács articulated in the revolutionary period of 1919 to 1925 based on his close reading of Lenin and Luxembourg? What in his critique of reification and defense of Marxist orthodoxy did the later Lukács disavow? What can we make of Lukács' legacy today? How have we received this investigation and elaboration of the problematic of Marxism? What are the essential issues raised for our time? And I'll be introducing the speakers in the order of their speaking. Um, Andrew Feinberg is a Canada Research Chair in Philosophy of Technology in the School of Communication at Simon, Simon Fraser University. Feinberg is the author or editor of more than a dozen books on technology, philosophy, and critical theory, the most recent being The Ruthless Critique of Everything Existing, Nature and Revolution in Marcuse's Philosoph Philosophy of Praxis from Verso Press 2023. When earning his PhD in 1972, Fiedenberg studied under Herbert Marcuse. Mike McNair is a retired professor of law at University of Oxford, where he authored numerous works on 17th and 18th, cent 18th century English legal theory. McNair is also a member of the Provisional Central Committee of the Communist Party of Great, Brit of Great Britain, CPGB, an author of Revolutionary Strategy, Marxism and the Challenge of Left Unity from 2008. Chris Catrone is a college educator, writer, and media artist committed to critical thinking and artistic practice and the politics of social emancipation. Catrone is an adjunct associate professor in the departments of art history, theory, and criticism, and visual and critical studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, an instructor at the Institute for Clinical Social Work, and has taught as a lecturer in the Social Sciences Collegiate Division of the University of Chicago, where he completed his PhD in the committee where he completed the PhD in the Committee on the History of Culture and, and an MA in Art History. He received the MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the BA from Hampshire College. His doctoral dissertation is on, on Adorno's Marxism. Um, and so for the event, each speaker will have 10 minute, 15 minutes to speak and then five minutes to respond to each other, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So, Professor Feenberg, if you'd like to begin. <laughs> Does this work? Sounds like it. Yeah. All right. I'm going to I'm going to uh, read a short paper that has some needs slides. You'll see why. Um, this is called the New Lukacs. The reception of Lukacs's history and class consciousness has always been fraught, even frankly hostile. The early attacks among Marxists in the Soviet Union and Hungary 
provoked Lukács to write a clarifying defense of his book, but he did not publish it, and it has only recently been available. Those early attacks were very effective. History and Class Consciousness practically disappeared after 1923 to be published in Germany with Lukács' permission only in 1967. So between 23 and 67, nobody, practically nobody could read the book. It was available earlier in 1960 in French translation, which is how I first read it. I studied the book with Lucien Goldman in Paris, along with Michael Lowy. We both wrote books about Lukács in the late 70s and early 80s, attempting to find a new path for Marxism in his work, but our voice was drowned out by a chorus of attacks on history and class consciousness. The doxa of the time was entirely negative. Lukács' concept of totality was said to be Hegelian rather than Marxist. His theory of class consciousness led directly to a proto-Stalinist concept of the party. He, viewed, he either viewed nature as a mere construction or, on the contrary, cleaved history from nature as though they could be separated, and so on. Lukács himself piled on, attacking his own early book in the preface to the new edition. The one heritage of history and class consciousness that survived the attacks, let me see. The one heritage of history and class consciousness that survived the attacks was the concept of reification, the transformation of human relations into the form of things, precisely what commodification accomplishes when the products of labor are exchanged, not between workers and consumers, but as goods exchanged for money. This concept reappeared, usually without citation, in the works of the Frankfurt School. It is important for Adorno, and Axel Honneth has written a book specifically on reification in an attempt to update the concept. In the 1960s, reification inspired the dystopian arguments of the Frankfurt School that culminated in Marcuse's concept of one-dimensionality. If you haven't read One Dimensional Man yet, go do it. It's fun. <laughs> Paradoxically, these arguments for one-dimensionality resonated with young people whose protests had a huge impact on society. My book on Lukács came out in 1981, so it's referenced there in the slide. It had no influence on the major players in critical theory, who by this time were fascinated by Habermas's approach, while in England, Althusser held sway among Marxists. In contrast with the usual view of reification as an ideology, I propose to treat it as a cultural phenomenon, patterning not only thought, but also the material culture of the society. This was my interpretation of Lukács' concept of the form of objectivity, an essential category of the book that was lost in the English translation. I'll say more about that. The alternative interpretation came naturally to me as a student of Marcuse, with his rather similar concept of one-dimensionality. Marcuse argued that one-dimensionality had penetrated the technology of capitalism, not merely its ideology. A careful reading of Lukács' text showed something similar. In 2014, I returned to my book on Lukács and revised it quite drastically on the basis of a much deeper understanding of Lukács' philosophical background in German neo-Kantianism and phenomenology. This new version of my book appeared at a time when a number of younger scholars were beginning to question the standard interpretations of Lukács. Three remarkable books have completely revised our understanding of history and class consciousness, at least in the English-speaking world. So I refer you here to George Lukács' Philosophy of Praxis, From Neo-Kantianism to Marxism by Konstantinos Kavoulakos, Lukács' Phenomenology of Capitalism by Richard Westerman, and Lukács, Praxis, and the Absolute by Daniel Andres Lopez. These books all take off from my earlier study and pursue it further, further in terms of neo-Kantian, phenomenological, and Hegelian influences on Lukács. I recommend these books as an antidote to much of the earlier scholarship, which all too often was ignorant of Lukács' intellectual context. I mean, to put it crudely, most of the earlier material is no good. So, so you should, if you've only been reading that stuff, you should start over. Uh.
with these books, or mine. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, the English translation of History and Class Consciousness has made it difficult, made it more difficult than it should be to understand that context. For example, consider this version of one of the key sentences in the whole book. After asserting that the commodity is the central structural issue in understanding every aspect of capitalist society, Lukács adds, quote, only in this case can the structure of commodity relations be made to yield a model of all the objective forms of bourgeois society together with all the subjective forms corresponding to them, end quote. The sentence seems to make sense, but what is an objective form? Unless we can understand this concept, it is not clear what Lukács is trying to say. In fact, the German original does make it clear. In place of the translator's objective forms, we find a specific neo-Kantian term, Gegenständlichkeitsformen, which you could translate correctly into English as forms of objectivity. And this term has a meaning in German neo-Kantianism. This term refers to a particular way of being an object, a particular type of what we might call objectness. In the contemporary German context, such ways are multiple. The natural sciences have objects of a certain type, quite different from the objects of artistic production, and so on. Persons are different objects from things, and so on. Many types of objects exist, each of them a coherent cross-section of the infinite complexity of experience. In the sentence I have highlighted, Lukács is saying that the commodity exemplifies a particular way of being an object that characterizes all objects in bourgeois society and shapes their subjective response to those objects. The form of objectivity is characterized in the first part of Lukács' essay on reification. The objects of bourgeois society come to resemble the objects of the natural sciences in terms of quantification and lawfulness. So the commodity is quantifiable by definition. Since the natural sciences are the paradigm case of rationality in this society, the imposition of its forms amounts to a rationalization of society. Rational forms resembling those successfully imposed on nature through experimentation, research, and technology have become social forms. In sum, capitalism strives to create what Lukács calls a second nature built out of the materials of the social world, including the human beings who inhabit that world and the artifacts and organizations they live with. This explains why the philosophical debate over the nature and limits of scientific technical rationality, which began in the 17th century and continued through Kant down to the present, turns out to be relevant to social theory. This surprising connection becomes visible toward the end of the 19th century, as the industrialization process reaches a climax. By the early 1920s, when Lukács wrote History and Class Consciousness, it was clear that the effects of industrialism went well beyond the expansion of markets into ever more aspects of social life. Apparent to Lukács, as to many of his contemporaries, was the parallel growth of mechanization and bureaucracy. Together with markets, these new techniques of production and organization amounted to the total submission of society to technical rationality. Reification had become the universal meaning of social objects. German philosophers struggled to save a remnant of culture from the aggressive advance of business and technology. The neo-Kantians distinguished meaning from factual existence in order to better understand the difference between science, art, and history. They introduced the notion that objectivities of different types reflect specific domains of meaning, that is, specific forms of objectivity. In this way, they attempted to escape the grip of a scientism that reflects the totalization of capitalist industrialization. But the gap between meaning and existence shows up in a problem that already worried Kant, the unknowable thing in itself. What is the social significance of this obscure philosophical conundrum? Lukács argued that the reified forms are instantiated in contents of some sort. So the commodity form is a form, and it has a content, which is the, the thing that it uh, covers. 
as a, as a commodity form. What is the relation between those forms and their content? Can the meanings fully determine the content? Or is there a remainder that escapes any formal structuring? The neo-Kantian problematic of the tension between form and content, the thing in itself, appeared now in the relation of technical rationality to the human beings whose lives it shaped. Where neo-Kantianism had found a theoretical limit, Lukács identified a practical one, resistance to the imposition of capitalist forms, class struggle. You may ask what these philosophical reflections add to the usual accounts of class struggle based on the exploitation of the proletariat. In fact, Lukács's argument brought Marxism into the 20th century. Previously, Marxists had denounced the irrationality of capitalism, but it was no longer possible to believe this without a significant concession. On the contrary, capitalism had been rationalized to the point where rationality itself appeared as a problem. Of course, at the macro level, capitalism still produced crises. We had one in 2008, and so could be said to be irrational. But the organization of all social institutions around rational methods imitated from scientific research required a new approach. This would have consequences for the idea of socialism Marxists did not heed. Engels, for example, believed the separation of management from ownership and the creation of national trusts already anticipated the planned society, although still under the exploitative control of capital. Such notions proved naive in the light of the rationalization of capitalist society and overshadowed more democratic notions of socialism that might have had more staying power than the bureaucratic Soviet system. Lukács did not anticipate all this in 1923. That would be asking a lot. His ideas on revolution were primary, primarily influenced by the success in Russia. He could not imagine the catastrophic effects of the Soviet version of rationalization, which was even more indifferent to its contents, namely the lives it structured, than the capitalist version. Nevertheless, there are occasional indications in his writings in this period that suggest the relevance of his theory of reification to the organization of socialist society. These indications are connected to his lingering loyalty to Rosa Luxemburg's theory of mass action and the idea of wor workers' councils. But can there be escape? There, there can be no escape from some sort of rationalization in a modern society. Lukács knew that. He was not a Rousseau going back to the woods. What is required is a way of bringing the contents into relation with the reified form so as to favor human life rather than capital. There is one passage in history and class consciousness that hints at this alternative. And it's, it's on the screen. Lukács writes, it's, a, it's rather obscure, but uh, in the context that I'm providing, I think it makes sense. The world which confronts man in theory and in practice exhibits a kind of objectivity which, if properly thought out and understood, need never stick fast in an immediacy similar to the forms found earlier on, including reification. This objectivity must accordingly be comprehensible as a constant factor mediating between past and future, and it must be possible to demonstrate that it is everywhere the product of man and of the development of society." End quote. Here, Lukács seems to imagine an alternative form of objectivity compatible with socialist democracy. While Lukács did not develop the implications of this passage, his critique of what came to be called instrumental reason or technological rationality inspired the Frankfurt School and contributed to a response to the technocratic tendency of advanced capitalism in the new left. Alienation from rationalized systems, reification, underlay revolts that took many forms. In 1964, in the Berkeley student revolt, students carried around posters that showed an image of a computer card. Uh, they, they, didn't, they, they knew they were part of a system, of a rational system. At, attempts to spread this new form of resistance to the traditional working class had some success at the time. 
Stanley Aronowitz wrote false promises to document these Lukacian revolts against the reification of the proletariat. I think that book was originally published in the 1980s. Once we understand Lukács in these terms, where can we go, both theoretically and practically? We must heed the contents of the reified forms. Those contents manifest themselves in progressive social movements that resist the rationality of the established system. I have focused on the technical politics that have, has arisen out of the ashes of the new left. There have been movements in medicine, urban affairs, communication, and the environment that aim directly at mediating between technical rationalization and human and natural needs. Other movements need to be studied in terms of the logic of reification and dereification. This is the living legacy of Lukács' famous book. So I put up here uh, the cover of my own book on Marcuse, which deals directly with these problems. And if anyone's curious, uh, I have a home page and a, a YouTube channel. So <laughs> it's full of fun stuff. Uh, Okay, thank you. Next, we'll have Mike McNair present his comments. Okay. Let, let, sorry, let me just wait uh, one minute. We'll just uh, get rid of this. All right, just start, sorry. <laughs> this might make a bit of noise, but try the microphone, is it good? Okay, is this working? Yep. Okay. Um, this is going to be uh, substantially less sophisticated, and it's about a, a part of uh, the uh, reception of history and class consciousness, and a little bit partly about uh, uh, its history, history and class consciousness seen as... Um, uh, philosophy in the service, in the immediate service of factional uh, politics. Like this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the immediate service of, uh, of factional uh, party politics. Yeah. Um, but also, actually, the appropriation of history and class consciousness in the immediate service of factional party politics uh, by uh, the Japan Revolutionary Communist League Kakumaru uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, by uh, the British Socialist Workers' Party, I think mainly after the uh, uh, 1971 translation, which... Uh, Professor Feinberg has been pointing out that it's defective, but nonetheless, that's the main route through which the text has been received. Um, <laughs> I start with uh, a little bit of uh, background. Um, Lukács uh, uh, was a Sorelian as a student uh, in 1905, 1906. That's an advocate of... Um, uh, a syndicalist critique of Marxism on the basis of the acceptance of the Bernsteinian conception of the crisis, crisis of Marxism. Mm. He's influenced uh, by Simmel and Weber in 1913 uh, and is still in 1917 anti-Bolshevik uh, and uh, joins the Hungarian Communist Party in 1918. Uh, absolutely immediately he's on active service uh, in the Hungarian government and in the uh, Hungarian uh, civil war. Uh, uh, History and class consciousness then is written in exile in Vienna. Um, 1923, he's been five years involved in Marxism, of which two years in Marxism of a, 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 a sort which is not just the uh, how shall I put it, uh, Sorel's appropriation of Bernstein's appro uh, 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 half-informed half critique of Marx. Um, and the two, two of those years has been in uh, uh, intense activity. Um, so it, we need to think about it in terms of this is a book written by a, he's not that young because he's been in the 30s, but he's very new as a uh, revolutionary socialist. Mm. 
the book is uh, transitional between the ultra leftism uh, of the Hungarian revolutionary leadership of, to which uh, Lukács was party and of the exile group in Vienna of which he was part which was associated with the uh, left communist left left communist uh, 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 tradition and uh, the politics of Lenin's uh, left-wing communism published in uh, 1920 and the uh, conceptions of the party and party organization uh, in the second and third congresses of Comintern uh, in 1921-22. And um, in that context, the moment it, 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 it contains a substantial element of it, uh, which is um, advocacy of, uh, because of this transitional character, there's quite a lot in the book uh, which is about the policy of the offensive, which is about the need for the communist parties to constantly go ahead, to move constantly ahead of uh, the uh, uh, state of the class movement to avoid fatalism, to avoid uh, gradualism, etc. Yeah. And this um, uh, uh, this aspect of the uh, perspective makes its publication comes out at a really unfortunate time from the point of view of its reception, uh, which is that it comes out uh, uh, in Vienna, but simultaneously with the fight which is going on in the Mosque in the Bolshevik part in the Russian Communist Party uh, in 1923 between the opposition and the um, uh, 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 majority leadership, um, which is uh, directed to the question of Trotsky trying to smear Zinoviev and Kamenev as being the guys who were responsible for the would have. Um, rejected the Bolshevik Revolution in October because of their unwillingness to take the initiative and lead, jump ahead of the class, uh, and that that led them to prevent uh, the, the leadership of Comintern to prevent an October which could have happened in autumn 1923. Um, I should say, just in passing, I think Trotsky was flatly wrong on this question. There was no chance of an October in. Uh, Germany in autumn 1923 in the first place because the uh, German Communist Party had wasted its forces on the march action where it attempted to jump ahead of the class and got smashed and in the second place because in reality the movements, the mass strike in uh, the Rhineland which was supposed to be the basis of the uh, thing was not actually a strike but a lockout uh, that the uh, capitalists called the workers out on strike to get rid of the French. Yeah. Okay, um, but then the consequence of that is that at the Fifth Congress of the Comintern in 1924, uh, history and class consciousness is denounced by uh, Zinoviev together with uh, Korsh's, uh Marxism philosophy. And the reason for that denunciation uh, is that these books are identified as being part of Trotskyism. Though there's actually no sign of any connection uh, between uh, Lukács and uh, the left opposition. Lukács, uh, in fact, goes on, he adapts himself. Uh, and uh, in 1928, in the Bloom Theses, uh, he writes uh, an entirely orthodox um, uh, uh, commentary of the period of uh, the ascendancy in the Russian party of Bukharin, Rykov, and Tomsky, uh, slow matter, gradualist, uh, 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 focus on the bourgeois revolution. So the Bloom Thesis is a project for uh, 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 the Hungarian Revolution along the lines of the line of Bukharin, Rykov, and Tomsky, but it comes out again, unfortunately, just before Bukharin, Rykov, and Tomsky fall, and in consequence, uh, Lukács uh, 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 is denounced for the Bloom Theses, and in 1933, in order to um, get himself back into the party for the anti-party struggle, he has to issue a self-criticism. Yeah. That is not, he's not self-criticizing history and class consciousness in the text of 1933. He's self-criticizing the Bloom Theses. Yeah. 
he does self-criticize history and class consciousness. And what he self-criticizes history and class consciousness for is the radical separation of natural science and uh, 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 the exchange between humanity and nature and the role of production in human consciousness. And he, that self-criticism, which he explains and which he repeats actually in the uh, 1957 text and again in his 1967 text on this question, this is clearly, in fact, already in the Bloom thesis, in the assumptions of the Bloom thesis, that the, uh, there is stuff which is voluntaristic in history and class consciousness uh, and um, that uh, the uh, radical separation of natural sciences and uh, the social sciences, which is basically Weberian and behind that Bernstein, um, is uh, undermines actually the most fundamental claims of Marxism. That if we're going to hold that view, that uh, he, 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 there's a very really radical separation, then there's no basis for saying that. Uh, 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 he, 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 the, the, that your project is a materialistic project. We can perfectly well say it's a, it's a dialectical project, no problem, but it would be useless to say that it's a materialistic project, or for that matter, that it's a historical materialistic project. Mm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so then, uh, back to the reception, and the Professor Feinberg talked about a reception through the Frankfurt School, and Marcuse, uh, who are, I think, doing something which is taking it as a dialectical revolutionary project, which is not, however, a materialist project. Um, the other side of this coin, uh, I guess we can add into this context, Michael Harrington translated uh, chapter one, What is Orthodox Marxism, uh, for the uh, Shachmanite uh, 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 Yipsel, uh, Young People's Socialist League in 1959. Um, and then, then I guess the French, I don't know what the political background of the French translation is, uh, but we can perhaps talk about that later. Um, but alongside that, I think that the appropriation by the Japanese, I don't know the exact date of it, but I guess that the appropriation by the Japanese is of uh, 1960s date. Uh, because that there is a the Japan Revolutionary Communist League is a post 1956 uh, new left left new left formation which breaks up into a series of different factions and the JRCL Kakumaru uh, is the one which is most emphatically Lukacian is most emphatically committed to uh, philosophy is the foundation of the separate existence of uh, the organisation. Mm. Um, in the, the, the effect of the 1971 translation, I, I, my, my initial encounter with this, I, this, this copy I bought in 1975, um, my initial encounter with this was the use of deployment of uh, Lukacian argument within the international Marxist group. Uh, as an argument for uh, redefining subjective and objective. Um, I must admit, I think the guys who were trying to use Lukács to redefine subjective and objective were intensely vulgarizing. Tony Whelan, John Ross and co were intensely vulgarizing uh, Lukács, so I won't go further into that. Uh, but we also get Lukács picked up a uh, much more bigger scale by the British Socialist Workers' Party. and. Um, the uh, guys who pick it up by uh, um, I've written about uh, I think uh, part of us circulated this uh, article The Philosophy Trap uh, I've referred to uh, the work of Alex Kalinikos and of John Rees uh, and for Kalinikos and Rees, what uh, Lukács is doing uh, is offering an explanation of the supposed deficit of class consciousness of the working class. And that this deficit of class consciousness of the working class is to be explained by uh, the essay on reification, etc. And uh, the, the 
strategic political corollary which emerges from that is that the working class escapes from the toils of industrial capitalist rationality um, only uh, when it when when people are on strike uh, in particular when people are on strike but also in other forms of mass movement so that the strategic line which emerges from this line is what we have to do is set the class into movement uh, and we set the class into movement on whatever the class is presently prepared to move on uh, so the formula which Tony Cliff, Tony Cliff derived this uh, at an earlier stage is moderate demands but militant action that it's the, the militant action which opens up the possibility of uh, what can properly be called uh, class consciousness. Mm. The other side of this reception is uh, the Lukács of towards a methodology of organization. Yeah. And uh, towards a methodology of organization and the aspect of history and class consciousness which is written around uh, the documents of the Comintern of 1920 uh, uh, And uh, that serves for the leadership of the Socialist Workers' Party and for a great many other uh, uh, Trotskyists as a Trotskyist charter uh, for uh, the ban on factions, the uh, centralized top-down military structure of the organization. Socialist Workers' Party is characterized by the fact that the Central Committee appoints full-time organizers into all the localities, uh, and the Central Committee's appointed full-time organizers in all the localities, direct the localities to act uh, according to the Central Committee. They have to do that because of the the, the strategic conception that class consciousness can only emerge in struggle. Uh, the party's task is to precipitate the masses into struggle, and in order to do that, you need to make sure that the whole party is doing the same thing, and that they aren't wasting time. Um, I remember uh, in the Socialist Workers' Party's Respect Project in 2001-03, which we were also part of, uh, they were sent out a circular saying you should uh, persuade people not to have political discussions at meetings because it's uh, off-putting to new uh, activists coming into the meetings and distracts attention from the meeting, organizing the outward looking towards the masses work uh, which the meeting wants to do. And uh, in Oxford, just as an anecdote, uh, we had a couple of guys who were ex-official Communist Party and they wanted the respect branch to discuss the uh, question of nuclear power, uh, policy towards nuclear power. And uh, the SWPers were unable to say anything until they'd previously asked their central committee for a line on nuclear power. Um, so that the process, uh, what we do, I'm, as I say, I'm talking uh, here about a form of reception of Luk Lukács, uh, which I find, as I said, I've read, a, not, I've, I've read the rather difficult translations of the JRCL Kakumaru's uh, uh, publications that not easy read because the translation from Japanese clearly does a translation problem more severe than the translation problem in the translation of Lukács itself. I've read too much of the Socialist Workers' Party stuff. I've read the same thing. The US ISO worked in exactly the same way. Um, uh, Mike, and, if you could wrap uh, up whenever you uh, get that's, sorry. Uh, so that's my, that's essentially what I'm saying is there is an appropriation of Lukács in the direction of Lukács as a charter for a particular sort of uh, direct actionist, semi-syndicalist uh, left, which is also a left which is profoundly top-down in its structural forms of organization. That's it. All right. Um, 
Almost 10 years ago now already, in late 2013, I wrote the following bulk of my remarks, which is taken from a longer essay, Why Still Read Lukács? The Place of Philosophical Questions in Marxism, published in early 2014 in the Platypus Review and in the Communist Party of Great Britain's Weekly Worker. Although my fellow panelist, Mike McNair, is familiar with my argument, my other interlocutor here, Andrew Feinberg, uh, perhaps is not. Um, Andrew's early book on Lukács, uh, more recently revised and expanded under the title The Philosophy of Praxis, was very formatively educational for me early on, especially on the Rousseauian roots of Marxism and the red thread of dialectics from Kant and Hegel to the Frankfurt School. Um, I will begin with a polemical jab, or perhaps just a jocular nudge directed at Mike, about his characterization of Kant and Hegel as expressing a philosophical counter-revolution against the Enlightenment, and especially as against, uh, specifically against Locke and Hume. Um, regarding Andrew, the dispute between Mike and me over Lukács might seem a debate over Marxism that might not be especially relevant in the present. Uh, I hope to explain my perspective on the simultaneous relevance and irrelevance of Lukács today. As I wrote in one of my exchanges with Mike and with the CPGB more generally in their weekly worker publication, the absence of Marxism is a task of Marxism. Uh, the recovery of Marxism that I think must take place at some point in the future will be over a great chasm of discontinuity and break, of which the present discussion is a symptomatic phenomenon. We are expressions of the very problem that we seek to overcome. I, seek the, I see the gulf between us and Lukács, at least the Lukács of his most significant work from 1923, as having opened indeed already a century ago, with what has become, with what has come uh, between since then as muddling the issues and confounding attempts to even address them, presenting a formidable obstacle to making sense of things, let alone clearly articulating the problem. Of course, readings of Lukács themselves express the ways we are stuck and prevented from formulating the proper questions to begin with. The question would be, as I put it 10 years ago, the place of philosophical questions in Marxism. Is Marxism a philosophy? Does the struggle for socialism require philosophy or a specific form of philosophy? This is where the notorious Frankfurt School formulation of critical theory comes into play. Namely, Marxism not as a philosophy, but rather as a theoretical critique. And a critique not of capitalism merely, but of the struggle for socialism itself, a critical self-consciousness. The issue is what kind? The aforementioned Frankfurt School considered Marxism to have succumbed in its degeneration to positivity and abandoned its negative character. For instance, losing the critical recognition of the negative character of the proletarianized working class and capitalism. It had forgotten, as Rosa Luxemburg put it, that the working class had no positive content to oppose to that of capitalism, but stood merely as the bankruptcy lawyer to liquidate it. And liquidate doesn't mean eliminate, but rather translate its value into another form, trans transforming its value. In this way, the social revolution of the proletariat was unlike that of any other in history. The proletarian struggle for socialism was unprecedented. This included the unprecedented nature of the tasks of its self-consciousness, especially as critical. What was forgotten was not simply the presence place in the historical process, positively, but what Marx and Engels considered the prehistorical character of all history hitherto, how the proletarian struggle for socialism was the final chapter of prehistory and hence negative. Lukács himself called attention to what he called the positive and negative dialectics in Hegel and associated the latter with Marx and the former with bourgeois society. Not to be undialectical and simply counterpose them, for the bourgeois positive dialectic must also be fulfilled as well as overcome in socialism. This meant that Marxism as a political movement itself required a Marxist critique. The crisis of Marxism had to be met by more Marxism, not supplementation from without, philosophical or otherwise. In short, the proletarianized working class's struggle for socialism required a critical self-consciousness, and Marxism provided this, 
without which the workers' economic, political, and social struggles would reproduce capitalism and not get beyond it. Marx had formulated his approach in the critique of the proletarian socialism of his time. Lenin and Luxembourg had critiqued the Marxism of their time. For Lukács, the need for this took place in dramatic form when the majority Marxist party, the SPD, conducted the counter-revolution in Germany in 1918 to 1919, precisely in the name of preserving the workers' interests, namely their interests in the existing social system of capitalism. Likewise, Stalinist policies in the USSR could be seen as driven by the needs and interests of the workers in the Soviet Union and elsewhere in a similar reformist and conservative direction. Eventually, Lukács backed off from his own critical perspective when it threatened to estrange him from the dominant Marxism of his time, namely Stalinism. The Frankfurt School, by contrast, maintained Marxism, however, partially, one-sidedly, as critical theory, as Adorno put it, praxis is the obsession of theory. With all this in mind, why read Georg Lukács today, especially when his most famous work, History and Class Consciousness, is so clearly an expression of its specific historical moment, the aborted world revolution of 1917 to 1919, in which he participated as a Marxist, attempting to follow the revolutionary Marxism of Vladimir Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, are there philosophical lessons to be learned or principles to be gleaned from Lukács' work? As from that moment in the history of Marxism, or is there rather the danger, as the CPGB's Mike McNair has put it, of theoretical overkill, stymieing of political possibilities, closing up the struggle for socialism in tiny authoritarian and politically sterile sects founded on theoretical agreement? Lukács wrote his work for other Marxists, and this led easily to its theoretical derangement outside of its original proper political context. One could say this of Marxism in general, and even of Marx's own writings in particular. A certain relation of theory to practice is a matter specific to the modern era, and moreover, a problem specific to the era of capitalism, that is, after the Industrial Revolution the emergence of the modern proletarianized working class and its struggles for socialism, and the crisis of bourgeois social relations and thus of consciousness of society involved in this process. Critical theory recognizes that the role of theory in the attempt to transform society is not to justify or legitimate or provide normative sanction, not to rationalize what is happening anyway, but rather to critique to explore conditions of possibility for change. The role of such critical theory is not to describe how things are, but rather how they might become, how things could and should be, but are not yet. The political distinction then would be not over the description of reality, but rather the question of what can and should be changed and over the direction of that change. Hence, critical theory as such goes beyond the distinction of analysis from description. The issue is not theoretical analysis proper to practical matters, but beyond that, the issue of transforming practices with active agency and subjective recognition, as opposed to merely experiencing change as something that has already happened. Capitalism itself is a transformative practice, but that transformation has eluded consciousness specifically regarding the ways change has happened and political judgments about this. This is the specific role of theory and hence the place of theoretical issues or philosophical concerns in Marxism. Marxist critical theory cannot be compared to other forms of theory because they are not concerned with changing the world and the politics of our changing practices. Lukács distinguished Marxism from contemplative or reified consciousness to which bourgeois society had otherwise succumbed in capitalism. The title of Lukács' book, History and Class Consciousness, should be properly understood directly as indicating that Lukács' studies, the various essays collected in the book, were about class consciousness as consciousness of history. This goes back to the early Marx and Engels who understood the emergence of the modern proletariat and its political struggles for socialism after the Industrial Revolution in a Hegelian manner, that is, as a phenomena 
oh, excuse me, that is as phenomena or forms of appearance of society and history specific to the 19th century. Moreover, Marx and Engels, in their point of departure for Marxism, as opposed to other varieties of Hegelianism and socialism, looked forward to the dialectical Aufhebung of this new modern proletariat, its simultaneous self-fulfillment and completion, self-negation and self-transcendence in socialism, which would be also that of capitalism. In other words, Marx and Engels regarded the proletariat in the struggle for socialism as the central key phenomenon of capitalism. But the symptomatic expression of its crisis, self-contradiction, and need for self-overcoming. This is because capitalism was regarded by Marx and Engels as a form of society, specifically the form of bourgeois society's crisis and self-contradiction. As Hegelians, Marx and Engels regarded contradiction as the appearance of the necessity and possibility for change. So the possibility, excuse me, the question becomes, what is the meaning of the self-contradiction of bourgeois society? The self-contradiction of bourgeois social relations expressed by the post-industrial revolution working class and its forms of political struggle. The question is how to properly recognize in political practice as well as theory, the ways in which the struggle for proletarian socialism, socialism achieved by way of the political action of wage laborers in the post-industrial revolution era as such, is caught up and participates in the process of capitalist disintegration. The expression of proletarian socialism as a phenomenon of history, specifically as a phenomenon of crisis and regression, the only way to abolish philosophy would be to realize it. Socialism would be the attainment of a philosophical world promised by bourgeois emancipation but betrayed by capitalism, which renders society, our social practices, opaque. It would be premature to say that under capitalism everyone is already a philosopher. Indeed, the point is that none are but this is because of the alienation and reification of bourgeois social relations and capitalism, which renders the Kantian Hegelian worldly philosophy of the critical relation of theory and practice an aspiration rather than an actuality. Nonetheless, Marxist critical theory accepted the task of such modern critical philosophy, specifically regarding the ideological problem of theory and practice in the struggle for socialism. This is what it meant to say, as was formulated in the Second International, that the workers' movement for socialism was the inheritor of German idealism. It was the inheritor of the revolutionary process of bourgeois emancipation, which the bourgeoisie, compromised by capitalism, had abandoned. The task remained. The problem today is that we are not faced with the self-contradiction of the proletariat struggle for socialism in the political problem of the reified forms of the working class substituting for those of bourgeois society and its decadence, we replay the revolt of the third estate and its demands for the social value of labor, but we do not have occasion to recognize what Lukács regarded as the emptiness of bourgeois social relations of labor, its value evacuated by apparently technical, but not political or social transcendence. We have lost sight of the very problem of reification as Lukács meant it. As Hegel scholar Robert Pippin <laughs> has concluded in a formulation that is eminently agreeable to uh, Korsh, Korsh's perspective on the continuation of philosophy as a symptom of failed transformation of society, in an essay now 20 years old, um, addressing how by contrast with the original left Hegelian Marxist Frankfurt School tradition, today, the problem with contemporary critical theory is that it has become insufficiently critical. Quote, perhaps philosophy exists to remind us we haven't gotten anywhere. The question is the proper role of critical theory and philosophical questions in politics. In the absence of Marxism, other thinking is called to address this. Recognizing the potential political abuse of philosophy does not mean, however, that we must agree with Heidegger, for instance, that, quote, philosophy will not be able to bring about a direct change of the present state of the world. Especially since Marxism is not only a history of a form of politics, 
but also, as the Hegel and Frankfurt School scholar Gillian Rose put it, a mode of cognition sui generis. This is because, as the late 19th century sociologist Emile Durkheim put it, bourgeois society is an object of cognition sui generis. Furthermore, capitalism is a problem of social transformation sui generis, one with which we still might struggle, at least hopefully. Marxism is hence a mode of politics sui generis, one whose historical memory has become very obscure. This is above all a practical problem, but one which registers also philosophically in theory. The problem of what Rousseau called the reflective and Kant and Hegel after Rousseau called the speculative relation of theory and practice in bourgeois society's crisis in capitalism recognized once by historical Marxism as the critical self-consciousness of proletarian socialism and its self-contradictions has not gone away, but was only driven underground. The revolution originating in the bourgeois era in the 17th and 18th centuries that gave rise to the modern philosophy of freedom in Rousseauian enlightenment and German idealism, and that advanced to new problems in the industrial revolution and the proletarianization of society, which was recognized by Marxism in the 19th century, but failed in the 20th century, may still task us. This is why we might still be reading Lukács. So I wanted to give our panelists a chance to respond to each other. Um, Professor Feenberg, if you'd want to start. Um, it's, on. it's on, okay. Um, I just want to say something about Mike's uh, um, argument about uh, the effects of Lukács' concept of the party on the... I mean, I can see that the Socialist Workers' Party might be a less attractive... Uh, party because of Lukács' influence, but uh, Lukács was writing in 1923. Um, he was influenced by Lenin, who was himself working in a tyrannical society, um, and Lukács was trying to overthrow a tyranny in uh, Hungary. And so uh, there's certainly questions you could ask about that context and how that affected his decisions. And if, if you then transpose what he was doing into an entirely different context, Britain today, it's not surprising that the results don't come up the way you'd expect. Um, right after I published the book uh, in 1981, a fellow named Henry Ehrman called me up and he said he had been in uh, 1933, he belonged to a party called the Neues Begin, the New Beginning Party, which was an offshoot of the Communist Party. And they had gone underground before Hitler's uh, successful election because they, they could see already what was going to happen. And their party was organized according to Lukacian principles. So he was very excited that someone had actually written a book about Lukács in which the principles of his party were explored. And that was a context in which what Lukács was talking about made perfect sense, again, as in Russia or in Hungary, but very different context, of course, from uh, the America today or Britain today. Um, I'm not sure how to respond to Chris. <laughs> so I'll let, I'll let Mike do that. <laughs> oh dear, I have actually responded to Chris in the pages of the Weekly Worker. I can't remember the exact date. Uh, 2013, 2014. Um, I, I think what I would say now um, is that I think there is too much Weberianism in history and class consciousness, and I think there is too much Weberianism in Chris's 
um, uh, uh, appropriation of history and class consciousness and the Frankfurt School. Um, my understanding, this is just, I'm going to speak to this issue, uh, so I, I'm sorry, I'm not responding to you, but my, understand, um, uh, my understanding of um, uh, the process of proletarianization is that proletarianization is the separation of the uh, worker from the means of production and uh, the development of the real subsumption of labor, that the worker is practically subordinated to the machine and the process by which uh, the logic of capital, uh, the cycle, money, commodity, production, enlarged commodity, altered commodity, enlarged money, becomes uh, world dominant so that that capitalist rationality becomes obligatory to everyone. Mm. And uh, my understanding is that that is a process which begins in the shipping industry of the late medieval Mediterranean and North Sea. And uh, which continues through. So I don't think there's a period of bourgeois society which offers us liberty, uh, which is succeeded by the period of industrial capitalism, which offers us uh, tyrannization over by rationality. Mm. Um, and on the contrary, uh, the transition capitalism is the transition from feudalism to socialism. It's the process whereby uh, the peasantry and artisan classes are proletarianized, and at the same time, uh, the uh, levels of production are concentrated, petty production is marginalized, and the question is posed to humanity that we have to take control of the forces of production which have been turned into forces of destruction which is what we see very clearly in the 21st century, that the forces of production turned into forces of destruction. Yeah. Uh, my understanding of the Weberian approach to this by separating, drawing the line at the development of steam-driven industry, uh, draws a line across the middle of the history of capitalist development, uh, and by doing so, what's created the history that Comrade Cotroni talks about is comparative statics, not history. Um, uh, uh, um, yeah, I shall leave that at, at that point. I do have something to say, but I've missed my notes on it. Thanks. Um, I guess my, my second uh, jocular nudge would be forces of production becoming forces of destruction. That sounds very Weberian. <laughs> um, okay, uh, but going back to it, um, I guess I would also respond to Mike by way of responding to Andrew, um, namely uh, forms of objectivity, right? Objective forms and subjective forms. I kind of teach that every year in my Adorno class. I teach that opening paragraph for the uh, reification and the consciousness of the proletariat. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I try to not draw a hard line between reification and objectification, but nonetheless show a distinction. Um, so I think that the issue there is... Um, what are we talking about when we're talking about um, the form of the commodity, right? So the form of the commodity, um, it's a form of social value, first of all. And second of all, its, its main object is labor. It's human activity itself, right? And so the question of can, can society, if you will, um, and this would be also in part a response to your presentation on the book yesterday, um, that can you divide between a uh, science and life world or a scientific technical process and a life world or nature? Um, and I think that this also goes to something that Mike brought up about the separation of natural science from social science. In fact, then, uh, if, if the object, if the form of objectivity is not um, just the sort of things, the objects that we grasp, but, but rather a kind of activity, a form of process, labor, 
um, this bourgeois category, this bourgeois social relation in particular, um, then that would give us a different kind of angle on it. And this would, uh, this would help with the issue of um, what Mike brought up, namely drawing a line in the history of capitalism, which Marx and Engels themselves did do. They did define capitalism as the contradiction, and with the steam engine, the contradiction of the bourgeois social relations and the industrial forces of production. So why would that matter? Well, because the, the uh, form of objectivity, uh, the social value of labor as an activity, um, goes from being of a form of emancipation to a reified form and a form of domination precisely when that form of social relation is no longer adequate to appropriate, grasp, utilize fully the scientific and technical development unleashed by the Industrial Revolution. That's the contradiction. In other words, there's no point in saying that capitalism originates in the late medieval era because, and I think that, Mike, you did try to address that, socialism was neither possible nor desirable in the late medieval era. It certainly wasn't necessary the way it is now. Right? So that distinction would hold. Socialism only becomes possible, necessary, and desirable with the Industrial Revolution. Okay, we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, I, I saw Ephraim's hand first on the left. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you all very much. I'd like to ask about the issue of a romantic critique of capitalism. Um, and I'm probably going to get the reference wrong, but in the piece Chris referred to by Robert Pippin, A Short History of Non-Being, there's also this issue of repeating romanticism. And Professor Feinberg, I was, you know, when you presented what was new about the issue of rationalization for Lukacs in the 1920s or in the 20th century, I thought that that was not so new and that someone like Thomas Carlyle would have expressed the issue of a kind of, you know, machinification of society in the 1820s and 30s from a romantic anti-capitalist perspective, you know, with the wonderful images of steam-powered speaking robot preachers to keep the workers in line, right? <laughs> or the application of um, chemical poison to control the population, right? Um, and Mike, I think that in the way that you talk about your difference with Chris on bourgeois society, you're partly trying to reject a romantic critique of capitalism by saying that, you know, to go against Weberianism, on the other hand, you open yourself up to adopting a romantic critique of capitalism by talking about the way you talk about the Middle Ages. And one could reverse Chris's formulation in response to you and say that, you know, in capitalism, the late medieval period comes to seem desirable. Also for Mike, you know, I think with the SWP, it's not just a matter of the organizational degeneration that Lukacs gives, seems to give license to, but also a romantic critique of capitalism and the idea of being finding the places that are outside of reification, or it kind of exacerbates that for them. And I take Chris's argument to be in some way raising the issue of how Marxism was not a romantic critique of capitalism. I think early on in Platypus, and th there was a criticism of the left as being stuck in a romantic critique of capitalism. And I think that has actually become a lot more obscure today. So my question to all the panelists is, where do we stand today with respect to the romantic critique of capitalism? And what does Lukács have to tell us about that? Maybe the concept of humanism that comes up in, in history and class consciousness. If I could just append to that. So Lukács' self-criticism is that uh, history and class consciousness was still 
too romantic. It still bore the uh, marks of his pre-Marxian self. Um, Yeah, that's very interesting. You can actually go back as far as Rousseau, who's complaining about the division of labor in the 1760s. Um, Michael Lowy is the guy who writes about romantic anti-capitalism. Um, and he, he was also, as I said in my talk, he was a student of Goldman along with me in the 60s. We both wrote books about Lukács based on our understanding from Goldman. The difference is that in Lukács, the problem of form and content is not treated in, the, in any romantic way. The content in a romantic, uh, the romantic idea which you mentioned would be to find some region that's external to the uh, mechanized part of society. Like it could be art, for example. Um, art could become a sort of a refuge from uh, reification. But, but Lukács doesn't argue that. What he argues is that the, the um, workers themselves, in the, the fact of their material existence, their moral and material existence, he says, they don't fit into the schema of reification fully. There's a kind of a miss, you know, the round pegs in small, in, in, in uh, square holes type problem. So the working class is confined by reification in a certain way that does not correspond exactly with its moral and material requirements. And that then results in the possibility, not the necessity, but the possibility of resistances that come from within the system, that are imminent to the system of capitalism, that are not external. So that would be the response I would give. Yeah, I, I guess I, I had my note in response to you was uh, over-determinist. That, that, um, it, <laughs> it seems to me that uh, Weber it's true of, and it's also true of uh, Lukács' influence by Weber, overstates uh, the extent of the power of capitalist rationalization. Uh, um, and I suppose I don't think I, I think it would be any wrong to call it resistances. But you know, I I, I spent two years uh, uh, fitting speedos into Morris Marinas on the uh, Cowley Assembly Works uh, in the Cowley Assembly Works in Oxford uh, Car Assembly Works, and uh, <coughs> every Thursday uh, it was payday, and a guy would come up and down the line with a bag of cannabis, selling cannabis, and uh, somebody else would come up and down selling uh, eggs or uh, 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 the bloke. And there were two of us on the uh, on on the um, speedo's job, and we could speed it, we could speed ourselves up and uh, then take one hour on and one hour off, as long as you didn't do it while the foreman was actually trying to control things. So that, 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 that just the sense of this is a highly mechanised, intense control Fordist uh, workplace, but there's actually quite a lot of um, uh, space within that highly mechanised uh, Fordist workplace for its own uh, cultural, etc., elements. Um, Ephraim, I, it, my understanding, I, the, the, I've just bought a book actually, which is about artificial intelligence in law, and it starts with Leibniz <laughs> and subsumption machines, and the idea of the robot judge is already, the uh, mechanical conception of the robot judge is already an idea of the 17th century. Yeah, and um, uh, e e e uh, the uh, as, as desirable, yeah, as desirable, but also as undesirable. So that it's 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 a conflict and a contradiction, and that sense that um, 
My understanding of the romantic critique of capitalism is not that it has to look for some romantic area which is outside of capitalism, uh, but that it has to seek a way of getting back, yes, a way of getting back to uh, the world of small businesses. Um, I've written a critique of the English Greens, left Greens, uh, 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 called Green Turns to Orange and Brown, uh, about uh, um, this idea that small business is better, small, small production is better. And that, that, I think, is where the romantic critique, in essence, goes. I saw Pam's hand second, so. Thank you. So I wanted to bring some of the presentations into conversation with one another. And the three of you pointed out different contexts for Lukacs. The context um, that Professor uh, Andrew brought up was neo-Kantianism, phenomenology, and this problem of forms of objectivity. And this problem of forms of objectivity, which you said, are potentially compatible with types of socialist democracy. And Mike Bignair brought up this factional strife, and specifically the documents of the common term from 1920 to 1921. And Chris brought up the crisis of bourgeois society and the sort of incomplete becoming of, of capital and the problem of Marxism as a politics sui generis. So I wanted to know what is the relationship between these three contexts? Are we talking about embedded problems? Are they completely different contexts? I got stuck with this question. Uh, <laughs> Lukács is obviously a very complicated guy because he can produce this much confusion. Uh, <laughs> um, the, 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 the crisis of bourgeois society and the party and forms of objectivity, all three can be related. It would take a little time to do a good job of it, but uh, the crisis arises from the fact that the form of objectivity specific to bourgeois society, the commodity form, no longer adequately controls the content, namely the human lives of the working class, and that then leads to the possibility of revolution, which uh, requires some sort of mediation because it's not going to happen just by people deciding that they don't like things. And that mediation that Lukács talked about was the party. In other words, the, the, what, what uh, Mike explained. And uh, so that, that's maybe some way of trying to put it together. But I, I agree, it's a, it's a, our panel really is a, <laughs> something, it's a special something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's actually easy to put together the neo-Kantianism issue and the uh, issue of uh, the factional context because the uh, neo-Kantianism issue is also a response to the so-called crisis of Marxism. Yeah, uh, that uh, this is responses of uh, the, the, the arguments for neo-Kantianism are being made by Bernstein, Adler, the revisionist wing of the uh, uh, Second International. Yeah. Um, so that that's, those are two issues which it seemed to me flow together very easily. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the party is uh, the sort of, uh, how shall I put it, I, uh, my personal view is I don't. I think that Lenin's conception of the party in 1921 uh, is a conception of what the Bolshevik Party did in 1918 to 21, and in left-wing communism he projects that back uh, falsely 
onto what the Bolsheviks had been doing between 1903 and 1917. Um, and so the, this, the flip side of this, this is not just a question of Russia and tyrannical regimes in Hungary. It's also a question of the failure of the socialists in Italy to take power, of the failure of the socialists in France to take power, of the Germans. They take power, but what they do with it is they create... Um, uh, Engels said of France that the Republic was the empire of 1799 without the emperor. Uh, the... Uh, Weimar Republic is the Kaiser Reich without the Kaiser. Uh, and they choose to do, that's a choice. They had a choice, they had an option. It was open to them. It was, wasn't guaranteed, it wasn't inevitable that they would do that. Yeah. It wasn't being non-revolutionary because they made a revolution, they overthrew the Kaiser. Um, but they chose to create a, 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 a regime with the single person and all the, the independent judiciary and all of that stuff. Um, so the, the, those things, I think, are interconnected because the judgment that the Communist Party and its militarized character was necessary is a judgment about uh, the West just as much as it's a judgment about the East. I can't, I can't make the crisis of bourgeois society work with that because I don't believe that there was ever a period in which there was bourgeois society without the presence of uh, capital and um, the impossibility of uh, the return to artisanate. Uh, that, that as soon as we've got uh, uh, gunpowder warfare and uh, uh, large-scale shipping and so on and so forth, we're into capitalism, not a bourgeois society uh, which gives rise to... Uh, capitalism gives rise to the idea of liberty, as one side of its politics, the other side being the idea of authority in the factory. But that's... Okay, yeah, this is a good direction to go in. Um, so the question of the party, and the question of the party as a form of mediation, um, rather than you know focusing on the party per se, I would want to address what the party was supposed to do. And for that, I think the prehistory of like the Bolshevik Revolution, Lenin, et cetera, is important. Um, meaning, how did the socialist parties in the period before World War I see themselves? Um, they saw themselves as both inheriting the bourgeois revolutionary tradition, the bourgeois democratic tradition, we might say, um, the, the bourgeois revolutions from the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, or maybe, maybe even going back to the 16th century with the Dutch Revolt. Um, and what that meant in particular was uh, the question of liberal democracy, modern democracy, the modern republic as opposed to the ancient republic, um, a form of democratic republic or a form of democracy that allows for the freedom of civil society vis-a-vis -vis the state. Uh, so their understanding was that actually capitalism had collapsed that, uh, had deformed that, that in the industrial era, uh, bourgeois democracy and the promise of the bourgeois revolutions um, had uh, regressed uh, such that, uh, again, the question of like tyranny, the question of tyranny, um, you know, is it, a, you know, I think that Andrew, you put it as um, the final essay in history and class consciousness towards a theory of organization. But that form of like organization, and Mike, you addressed that as being very much about um, the early Third International moment and appropriate to tyranny, not appropriate to a liberal democracy. Well, the question is, what kind of a liberal democracy are we living in now? In other words, the old Marxist critique is that this is actually a tyranny that pretends that it is not. In other words, we live in a society of advanced industrial capitalism, capital accumulation, according to the principles that have been left behind historically and have been thrown into crisis historically according to the principles of 1776 and 1789, according to the principles of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, all equal, um, egalite, fraternite, liberté, uh, but that capitalism has actually uh, wrecked that in a very particular way. Um, and that the socialist movement was meant to both uh, 
fulfill still that those desiderata of bourgeois freedom while also recognizing that the point would be to move society beyond the need for a kind of liberal democratic bourgeois republic uh, promised by the bourgeois revolution. So it's a kind of a dual movement to both fulfill the bourgeois revolution that had been betrayed in capitalism, but also get beyond the need for the form of politics that capitalism seems to demand. Um, so for instance, and I think that Andrew, you, had, you did write about this in the revised version about democracy, that it's it, it, almost impossible to think about the modern demand for democracy apart from capitalism. In other words, the capitalism both generates the demand for democracy as well as violating that democracy. And that that's a kind of a recurrent problem. And of course, you know, to hark back to the kind of utopianism of Marxism, Marx in the critique of the Gotha program or Lenin in the state and revolution, the point is not to achieve a perfected democracy, but to overcome the need for democracy. In other words, that the need for uh, democracy as we experience it in capitalism is a specific need generated by capitalism and overcoming capitalism would overcome the need for uh, a democratic state, which M Marx called um, evidence of unfreedom. I mean, he said, as long as you still need a democratic state, you're not free. You know, so that sounds like anarchism. And of course, he did say the anarchists are right. And Lenin also said the anarchists are right. What they're wrong about is how we're going to get there from here. And how we're going to get there from here, according to Marxism, is precisely in and through these kinds of political forms that capitalism necessitates and that capitalism also thwarts. So it's sort of, uh, that's the dialectic of, of the political question in capitalism. And socialism is meant to self-consciously take on that problem rather than use kind of liberal democratic phraseology, phraseology to justify what is essentially tyranny still. I saw Danny's hand down here. Uh, thank you. I had two quick questions. So one of them is for uh, everybody and one of them is specifically for Chris. So I was interested about uh, why the panelists see maybe uh, critical theory and Trotskyism seeming to converge in the 60s and 70s. Meaning I'm thinking about in history and class consciousness to my knowledge, maybe Lukash mentions Trotsky once. I think he quotes terrorism and communism, but I can only imagine what, you know, Trotsky would have thought about critical theory in the 20s and 30s. And I, you know, while maybe Adorno has something positive to say about uh, Trotsky, these are kind of different things. But then I think of someone, I can give an example like Cliff Slaughter, who when he becomes a Trotskyist also reaches for Lukash. And I was just reading somebody, John Hoffman, who kind of has a critique of Lukash and he kind of likens it to Trotskyism. So the first question is kind of, how do you see this kind of convergence of, uh, or maybe convergence, or this parallel between critical theory and Trotskyism uh, in the latter part of the 20th century? And then for Chris in particular, you're talking about critique as the conditions of possibility. And, you know, I was thinking of the title of the Marx Engels book, The Holy Family or the Critique of Critical Criticism, right? It's a great title. And the reason I bring that up is because for them, and I know Lukács didn't have access to this at the time, but in the German ideology he says, maybe the young Hegelians are actually the true conservatives because in giving a critique, they're kind of giving the theoretical feel for transformations of capitalism. And Lukács has his own way of putting this, where he says the proletariat is like the practical critique. It's not just de-reifying things, it's potentially making them more decadent. That's at the end of the standpoint of proletariat. In other words, could you go into like critical theory is, would perhaps be seen as maybe even, redundant would be too strong of a word, but theory itself was supposed to already be a critique. So to have a critical theory could not simply stop at just the conditions of possibility, but that critique itself could partake in transformations of capitalism. That you could have the discontents of the proletariat partaking in changes. So those are the two questions. I can repeat them if... I'll just respond very quickly. So that's what I was trying to address with the positive and negative dialectics that um, uh, Lukács mentions in the original preface to history and class consciousness. 
Um, and you know, and what Adorno later, um, took up as the dialectical critique of the dialectic itself, right? So the idea that, um, we only need the dialectic insofar as we live in capitalism and the dialectic is always in danger of affirming capitalism. Um, and so that's why you need a negative dialectic or a critical dialectic or however you want to put it. And that would be to uh, recognize that this need for kind of a critical theory is an, another kind of phenomenon of capitalism, is another kind of symptom of capitalism. Um, that the movement of, of history beyond capitalism would no longer be, as Adorno put it, neither a totality nor a contradiction. Right. So again, rather than thinking, well, we have to think the totality because there's the totality. Rather, this is a specific phenomenon. In other words, conceiving of society as a totality is a specific phenomenon of capitalism. Um, and so I don't know if that sailed off into pure esoterica. <laughs> On the Trotskyists and uh, uh, Lukács, I, my understanding of what happened is that in 1956, the Hungarian Revolution broke out and uh, a whole load of people broke from the Communist Party. And the large majority of them were very concerned not to fall into Trotskyism. They were concerned not to fall into Trotskyism because the context was that everybody believed in the People's Front and national roads because 1941 to 49 is terror enormous evidence of the success of the People's Front and national roads. And in fact, also, we're in the midst of the high period of belief in Soviet industrialization that they thought that it got much further than it had uh, and so on. But it was inhuman. Yeah? And in that context, uh, this uh, idea of the inhumanity of rationality, the, 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 the Weberian aspect of Lukács, coupled with the fact that it also preserves the concept of the party monolith, because the concept of the party monolith is already in the 1921 stuff, it was an easier break uh, for people, for the majority, large majority of people, it was an easier break to become Lukatians than to become uh, Trotskyists. Okay, now the Trotskyists are still squashed and were still squashed and are still squashed by the apparent dominance of uh, the People's Front. Yeah, uh, the, I say are still squashed because actually that's what the neo intersectionalism stuff is: is popular frontism. Yeah, is Dimitrov's conception of unity, um, but uh, the but were squashed, and hence the emergence of Lukatianism and variants appropriation of Frankfurt School, but also appropriations of soft Maoism and various other things, all emerge in the aftermath of 1956 among the people who are not prepared to become Trotskyists. And the Trotskyists remain a minority, and then the Trotskyists, people who have broken from Trotskyism, which Cliff and co. had broken from Trotskyism and already thought of themselves as Luxembourgists at the time when this stuff is beginning to be published, they are influenced directly by HCC um, because of that, uh, because of their non-Trotskyism. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that, 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 that makes it, when the Mandelite International fell apart, which happened in the mid-1970s, the uh, uh, cliff tendency became much the largest global Trotskyist tendency, and uh, their ideas then spread across the whole of uh, very wide areas of the far left. Yeah, um, I just want to say something about the, the question of theory and the relation of theory to practice. You know, this reminded me, this discussion of Lukács in 56 reminded me of an interesting a story about Lukács. He was, the minute he was arrested, he, he joined the government of Naji uh, as Minister of Culture, I think, and then he was arrested when the Soviets arrived. And uh, the Soviet officer um, entered his office and demanded that he hand over his weapon. And he went like this. 
So um, theory is not uh, aufgehoben by practice. I mean, it's not like it sort of disappears or is un uh, insignificant. You have to remember that we're talking about politics, and politics is a relation between human beings, and in that relationship, all um, knowledge plays a role, right? And uh, so what Lukács argued was that uh, theory becomes practice at a certain point in the history of the revolutionary movement. Uh, that the theory is realized in practice by people who take on in their particular situation the positions that are generalized in the theory. But, um, but this doesn't mean that theory goes away or that it's somehow it's... Uh, because you know, there will always be a need. Just as the same problem with the party. There's always a need for a party, for some sort of organizational form within which people can interact and uh, form a will. So, um, and Lukács, his, his particular version was very much drawn on the basis of Lenin's work, but also... There is an interesting passage at the beginning of the essay where he says, Rosa Luxemburg had the clearest understanding of mass action. So he's still trying to somehow synthesize Luxemburg and Lenin. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, if, you, if you read the essay carefully, he's, really, he's trying to say that the party does not act for the class or substitute itself for the class. The party is the... Um, helps the class to form a, a will and a consciousness that is unified and that can have an impact on history. Um, now, of course, this can easily, as I think Mike is, ex would explain, it can easily turn into something very different. But, uh, but I don't know that we can, t that it's Lukács' fault. <laughs> so, Victor? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we have three dates uh, for our conference uh, of these first few days, uh, 1923, 1973, and 2023. And in 1973, uh, Michel Kluska, a French student of Goldman and of Lefebvre, uh, uh, in the name of Lukács, publishes a book called uh, Neo-Fascism and the Ideology of Desire, which is a critique of, sorry? Michel Kluska? Uh, and it's a critique of the, the sort of new left intellectuals who, uh, so a Lukacian critique of new left intellectuals who he thought had abandoned the workers. Um, um, and uh, the Kluskardians, the people who then, the disciples of Kluskar, are now the people who in France publish uh, uh, the works of Lukacs and the works of Go Goldman uh, and have become really quite popular over the past few years. Uh, especially publishing the late Lukács and his uh, uh, book, The Destruction of Reason, uh, that has also become perhaps the most popular work of Lukács in the past few years. And the number of articles in Jacobin magazine, for instance, uh, refer to, to that book as a way of criticizing both uh, postmodernism and um, identity politics, right? Uh, also more or less in the, names of, in the name of the working class and, and the working class's uh, morality and, and uh, um, rationality acquired in the process of labor, something like this. So I was wondering what to make, what do you make? I think that this echoes a number of things we've encountered over the, over the past few days in this conference. But I was wondering what you make of that resurgence of the late Lukács, um, and uh, uh, inclusing, uh, like in, especially in the French tradition, I'm, I'm thinking inclusive as part of that, the same inheritance that, that you have of the sort of heavily Heideggerianized uh, Lukács that comes out of Merleau-Ponty. Uh, uh, Merleau yeah, just to add to this, that Merleau-Ponty is the one who brings Lukács to France in 45, 47, who tries to get Lukács translated into French, 
as part of his struggle within the Communist Party uh, and, and to escape the authoritarianism of the Communist Party and it's translated by Axelos, who's a, a Trotskyist or who was identified as a Trotskyist at least in the sort of Greek uh, Communist Party also because of his dissidents. Um, um, just to, to respond to, to Mike's uh, 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 representation of Lukács as, as primarily, uh, uh, yeah, anyway. So I was wondering what, what to make of that second uh, reception of, of, that contemporary reception of the late Lukács and not the early Lukács. Um, Oh, uh, really? Okay. No, because, uh, Andrew, do you have any comment on the late Lukács? <laughs> I'm not sure I know as much as you do about this, um, so it's hard for me to, to answer. Uh, the, the late Lukács is quite different, it seems to me. He gives up the... Um, the concept of reification. And without that concept, the whole enterprise of history and class consciousness disappears. And um, so I've, and personally, that has not interested me, this later Lukács, because of this absence of the, the, the concepts that's, that seem to me most important and that have a history in the Frankfurt School. So now the fact that it's come back in France is interesting, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. But I'm not sure what what it signifies. I guess I don't know how to answer the question. I, I again, I don't know the answer to this because I just don't know enough about the thing. But my my guess would be uh, that uh, postmodernism and Foucaultianism have run into the ground. Um, and that then uh, we look for uh, 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 a philosophical critique which is not merely the reassertion of the um, uh, uh, normal science, that people look for a philosophical critique of those trends, which, which can, something which can be used as a philosophical critique of those trends, which is not merely the reassertion of normal science, and uh, that Lukács you know, would be usable from that point of view. My, my, I, I, my impression, my introduction, I think I was trying to make the point that there is a sense in which there's less distance between early Lukács and late Lukács, because early Lukács is also writing instrumental philosophy um, in relation to uh, the politics of the communist movement, just as much as he is writing instrumental philosophy in relation to the politics of the communist movement in the later period. Uh, I'll just, you know, because it's obligatory that Adorno called the destruction of reason evidence of the destruction of Lukács' own reason. Uh, harsh. <laughs> Um, uh, I actually wanted to say, I wanted to ask since, uh, you knew Lucian Goldman, right? So, uh, maybe, uh, this would have something to do with, uh, cause Goldman wrote a book, uh, hypothesizing that Heidegger's philosophy was in large measure a response to Lukács and to Marxism. Um, and that that might have some bearing right, considering that the French fries are nothing if not Heideggerian. Uh, so maybe you could fill us in on that a bit, because that might draw the connection. Well, it, it's uh, Luca, uh, Goldman's first book, his thesis on Kant, has an appendix. I can't remember exactly the date, but maybe it's 1950 or something. It's really quite early. And in that appendix, he proposed this hypothesis, which he later developed into a whole book. It, and his argument was that concepts such as being and uh, in Heidegger correspond to concepts such as totality in Lukács. And he tried to work out a whole scheme where you could, you could see 
uh, Heidegger's 1927 being in time, responding to and trying to overcome what Lukács had done in 1923. Um, I don't know that there's any actual evidence that this is correct. Uh, it's a very interesting book. It's, it's, it's full of insights, but um, there's a common background, which is the, the phenomenological and neo-Kantian background that both Heidegger and Lukács um, were trained in. And so you could argue that the similarities are the result of, not of some direct inf influence, but rather a, this shared background that they have picked up in different ways. One in a conservative existentialist way, the other in a Marxist way. Um, I, so I guess the problem really is, could so, does somebody know that Heidegger actually read history and class consciousness. Um, there is a reference to reification at the end of the book, but reification was not exclusively a Lukacian invention, so it could be that it, he talks about the reification of consciousness and, and the, I think it's the last page, or almost the last page of being in time. So we don't really know the answer to this uh, question, but Goldman's the hypothesis is interesting. Yeah, there's one line uh, that uh, we should recall from, from Lukács. Uh, in capitalism, uh, time becomes everything and man is nothing. Right? Sounds very Heideggerian. Uh, I just want to say we're going to go till about 7.30, so we have 30 minutes left. Um, I saw Justin in the back and then Aaron. Hi. Uh, so this is a simple-ish question. The context has a few moving parts, but it's kind of building off of Ephraim's, um, also well, building on, but also veering off of Ephraim's question about the romantic character of capitalism. So, Mike, you mentioned in your um, opening remarks that Lukács kind of took left-wing communism, Lenin's left-wing communism, as a critique of himself, um, and that history and class consciousness was his response to that. And I take that as basically him saying, um, in the vein of like a critique of left wing communism, that we can't just start, or we can't just start anew with a struggle for socialism using fresh political forms. You know, going to your point, Andrew, that are untouched by rationalization, but instead have to work through the self contradiction of this struggle um, itself. Um, and this is sort of within the broader context of Lukács's argument about the commodity form as a symptom. Well really the commodity form as expressive of all the social relations characterizing capitalism, more specifically that the value form of social labor has become inadequate to its content. I think when Lukács discusses this, he's referring specifically to proletarian political practice, which points beyond itself in the second international. Um, so there's a self-contradictory struggle for socialism. Um, so all that being said, uh, can we have reification without the self-contradictory struggle for socialism manifesting in a political party? And if so, what would that look like? Well, that's of course, the, this Lukács thought that you could not have reification without a tension arising between the reified forms and the human content. And that was to be the foundation for the revolution. That was why you could have Marxism as, a, uh, as an alternative to bourgeois thought and uh, social movements that would not just you know, modify this or that aspect of capitalism, but overthrow it. Because, so now, when you read One Dimensional Man or Adorno in the, 19, in the early 60s, you get the impression that reification is total and that there is no longer this um, tension between form and content. That people have, the human side has now become completely absorbed into the commodity structure. And uh, 
that was an exaggeration, but a very fruitful exaggeration because it, it corresponded to a kind of dystopianism that led to lots of resistance. I mean, precisely because you're in dystopia, you must become an individual and uh, break out of the forms that everybody else is uh, um, overcome by. So it's, uh, so it's a strange paradox, you know, that the, the, this extreme dystopian logic produces resistances, produces, uh, in other words, reproduces the tension between form and content that it was supposed to eliminate. And so I think this is a way of thinking about how the new left arises out of a kind of desperation about the administered society. Um, but also, I agree with that, but also about the new left's collapse. Because the, the premise of the new left was that the proletariat is, law, is, 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 is administered out of political significance. And then the late 1960s, the proletariat comes into action in the form of extensive uh, uh, wildcat strikes um, in the United States, in Britain, in um, uh, Germany, France and Italy a bit late relative to that. Uh, uh, Spain and Portugal are later. Um, but there's also the... Uh, Again, the reassertion as against the administered society of the uh, the national struggles of the colonial world uh, exploding, uh, and the consequence is that SDS, both the SDSs collapse and leave behind them moderately substantial Maoist organisations, um, uh, uh, some small terrorist groups, the Weather Underground and the RAF. And um, uh, 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 and we had a tiny little microscopic terrorist organisation in early 1970s England, whose name I could, escapes me. Yeah, hmm? Angry Brigade. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. But that, uh, um, uh, in that sense, the, the assumption of the, the, the dystopianism, the assumption of the dystopianism is that the contradiction for capitalism represented by the working class is dead. And uh, that then is falsified. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I mentioned the book False Promises by Stanley Aronowitz. He may have been forgotten by now, but he was an interesting social theorist and he was a worker. He started out as a worker and a trade union leader and ended up as an academic. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but in that, but I mean, it's important because he actually was able to spend a lot of time learning a great deal about social theory. And that book, False Promises, is a kind of attempt to Lukacianize the um, re reassertion of the working class. Uh, in the in the seven the late seventies and eighties, um, so I recommend it if you're interested in in working class, in Lukacs and the working class. This would be a way to learn something about how they connect. So if I could just say, uh, you know, Mike had raised the fact that um, generally. Um, Lukács was new to Marxism when he wrote History and Class Consciousness. For someone relatively new to Marxism, uh, actually, however, the, the book is a document of an intense kind of self-education in Marxism. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why uh, Lukács remained kind of theoretically enduring through different historical periods is because of the way he processes both Das Kapital and uh, the history of Marxism at one, at one and the same time and using uh, categories to kind of link them together um, in a way that uh, really has seldom been done, right? So I'm a student of Moish Postone here at the University of Chicago. And, you know, Moish's work was brilliant with regard to reading Marx, Das Kapital, but on condition of being hived off from 
any consideration really of the history of Marxism. Um, so I think that uh, that aspect of Lukács, um, he accomplished more than just a theoretical justification of the third international politics of the time. Uh, he did have an insight into, um, I think that Korsh puts it this way, who wrote independently of Lukács, um, but in a very kind of parallel and similar way, um, that uh, forgotten aspects of Marx suddenly came back to light. And the idea is that uh, the forgotten aspects of Marxism, specifically forgotten aspects of Das Kapital, came to light uh, in view of the politics of uh, the crisis of Marxism. And again, it is true that the crisis of Marxism is a phrase introduced by the revisionists, but then taken up wholeheartedly by the orthodox in, in the Second International, or at least by the young orthodox, namely Lenin and Luxembourg. Um, and in other words, what Luxembourg said is that uh, the revision of Marxism under the influence of neo-Kantianism more or less, but we could, can't just blame neo-Kantianism for this, was actually a, a, a expression of the strength of Marxism, the development of the movement, that it had reached such a point where it could question its own raison d'etre. It could question its own purpose. Um, and that happens again around the Russian Revolution and around the other you know, revolutions that take place in Europe in the wake of World War I. Um, namely, that there are these mass parties, but their actual purpose is thrown into question. And I think that that's really what motivates Lukács. Um, and, you know, I think that he is a Weberian in a sense, but that he has a, a new kind of Marxist way of explaining the problems that Weber had raised about means ends, rationality, form content conundrums with respect to bourgeois society and capitalism, that suddenly the problems that Weber was raising made sense in a new light when seen not only from a Marxist theoretical perspective, but also when seen in the Marxist movement itself, right? That the Marxist movement itself reproduced the kind of form content and means ends problem that one was see seeing in capitalism writ large. Uh, hi, I hope my question isn't too late because it's kind of picking up on things from earlier in the conversation, but I think it relates. Um, so there was a discussion at the beginning of the Q&A about the difference or maybe not the difference between bourgeois society um, and capitalism. Um, it reminded me of something Engels says, and I believe the preface to uh, the Civil War in France, but I might be wrong about where it is, um, which is that Marx and himself, Marx and Engels, they don't talk about things, but about processes. Um, and one way of thinking about that, I think, when it comes to bourgeois society, but also capitalism, is the process and then the repetition of the revolution. So in bourgeois society, you know, you have the Dutch Revolt, 1688, 1776, 1789, um, uh, but also 1848, um, which, you know, Marx very famously says, um, Hegel understood that all great world historical events um, happened twice. He should have said the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. Um, and, you know, the difficulty with the 1848 revolution is that as opposed to the bourgeois revolutions, which go from victory to victory, the 1848 revolution failed. Um, Rosa Luxemburg thought that 1917 and that period from 1917 to 1919 was a repetition of 1848. Um, and Lukács, in trying to kind of understand what is orthodox Marxism and really taking up both Luxembourg and Lenin, I think, you know, for that reason, probably goes back to Marx. Um, reification kind of obviously seems to come from the commodity fetish, um, though it's a bit of a different idea. Um, and maybe even, I, I don't know if this is a good idea, but more provocatively, perhaps, you know, when he says that in reified man, um, reification meets its outer limit, could be seen as, I think, in some ways very similar to Marx's idea that Bonapartism is the negative image of the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, and so my question is, uh, because you know Marxism 
seem, the formative moment for Marxism is the failure of the 1848 revolution. And Lukács seems to be trying to recall and recover that critical recognition um, in the context of the failure of 1917 to 1919. And in fact, you know, the Orthodox Marxists were involved in that as well. Why is it why is it that there are more obstacles to its recovery? Um, and why does Lukács seem to need to recover it differently? Um, for example, talking about reification or all these sorts of things as opposed to the commodity fetish or in the terms of um, political economy provided by Marx. Um, I don't think that, I must admit, uh, justice with Chris's point, I don't actually think this works. Uh, Mark Mulholland's book, Bourgeois Liberty and the Politics of Fear. Every bourgeois revolution, starting with the Dutch Revolt, and indeed actually one can say starting going back into the uh, city-states of uh, medieval Italy, every bourgeois revolution starts with the mobilization of very broad masses, the proclamation of very extensive liberty, and moves more or less rapidly to the creation of constitutions of the, with the single man uh, the single person, this is uh, the, the slogan which was used in the creation of Cromwell's regime in the 1650s. Um, uh, Bonaparte, uh, a whiff of grape shot, uh, and all of that stuff. So the 1848 is not Marx. Uh, uh, Nagel's thought that 1848 was a novelty. It wasn't. It was just the normal form of uh, the, 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 uh, what happens in the bourgeois revolution. Secondly, in relation to um, uh, building a whole phenomenology out of the first part of Capital One, uh, Marx commented on uh, the question of the expropriation of the proletariat and on the struggle over the working day uh, in the or text of the of the uh, uh, preface to the contribution to critique of political the, uh, the, uh, to the contribution to critique of political economy that this aspect shows the limits of the dialectical presentation mm -hmm. uh, that at this point the di and this is the second half of volume one of capital yeah, the whole of the second half of volume one of Capital is covering ground which Marx thought could not be developed dialectically out of uh, the in unfolding logic of the contradictions of commodity uh, in the first part of Capital One. So that the, in terms of, uh, is it a recovery of Marx? No, I think it's a construction, Lukács is a construction on the basis of part of Marx at the expense of other parts of Marx. And that's, I also think that's true of the concept of the party because Marx gave us arguments for the concept of the party and Marx's arguments for the party is that the proletariat needs to get beyond the strike struggle and the guerrilla struggle of trade unions to proposing, posing itself as the leadership of the society through the political struggle for laws. Uh, that's Marx in several places in uh, 18, the 1860s, early 1870s. And um, that's a very different conception of what the tasks of the party are uh, to the conception which is in the Congress of the Comintern. Yeah. Uh, I can say something about the difference between the fetishism of commodities in capital and Lukács' concept of reification, which I think you, you were asking about. Um, the, the fetishism of commodities is treated in capital as an economic problem. It explains something about the nature of the capitalist economy, which is very special. It's very different from all other economic systems because of the, uh, the way everything is sort of run through the market. Right? It, Whereas in earlier economic systems, there's a great deal, the great majority of goods are um, traded or used locally. Whereas here you have a, a market that, so he, he uses the concept of fetishism of commodities to understand the uh, effect of this marketization of the economy. Lukács understands this, but he also 
argues that something else is going on, and this is why I, told, I said it's a 20th century version of Marxism, something else is going on of which the fetishism of commodities is only a part, it's an aspect, and this something else is the rationalization of society. So here, this you could say is the Weberian moment in Lukács, although he treats it very differently from Weber, who doesn't have a notion of uh, resistance or of, of uh, a dialectic uh, of form and content. So what happens when you, I mean, why would he do this? Well, because he can see that huge administrations are being built uh, to manage the society. And these administrations are operating according to rational schemes. And uh, mechanization has now overturned um, a very large portion of the, uh, of the economy as well. So again, you, you see um, ideas that were originally proposed as epistemological notions about science becoming social ideas. You, you can understand the social world now through these uh, quasi-epistemological ideas that derive ultimately from a notion of reason which begins in the 17th century and is modeled on the natural sciences. And so reification, in other words, I, I mean, you can see then the fetishism of commodities as a form of quantification and law. It gives a quantified form to the economy, it, it makes it a lawful entity, although of course it's a human entity, it has the structure, the lawful structure of something natural, and this is bizarre, and requires, you know, a, a, a new way of thinking. And so I think that Lukács' reification concept is really very a very important innovation in the history of Marxism, because it, it goes beyond the limits of Ninth, of the 19th century industrial economy that Marx was dealing with to bring us into a 20th century economy that's uh, based on bureaucracy and wide-scale mechanization and um, uh, the rationalization of the social order. We'll take one more question, Ed. Professor Feinberg, your comments just now brought to mind your exchange earlier today with members of Platypus, uh, during which you stated that the 1960s social movements broke out of the administered world. And so I'm wondering, given the process you just described, it seems to me the premise of the Platypus members was that that process had, in fact, been applied to the social movements for a very long time now. And, and you seem to be departing from a, a different assumption. So I'm wondering if, if you and others could, could discuss this. And perhaps maybe if you would like to wrap up some closing remarks as well. Well, I, I can't remember exactly which conversation. There have been so many. But uh, I think the, what I, I think I was objecting to the um, premise that seemed to be a, a, a platypus premise, according to which the new left was simply a, a failure because it had not achieved um, or even tried to overthrow capitalism. And this reminds me of something important in Lukács that we should really keep in mind. In, in the Lenin essay that he wrote in 1924, he argues that the... the um, the specificity of Lenin's politics depends on what he called the actuality of the revolution. The actuality of the revolution is that period in history when it is, it is plausible to overthrow the system. It's not necessary, there's no determinism, but, but you can see that the possibility is there of this kind of overthrow. Whereas there are long periods in history which are not the actuality of the revolution. There are periods in which struggle goes on, but under much less favorable conditions. And I think there's a, a confusion about what the New Left could accomplish in the 1960s uh, and 70s, and, and even today, what, what we have in the way of struggles today. 
These are struggles that are taking place not in the actuality of the revolution era, but in a period of general passivity and, uh, um, and weakness of the social uh, movements. Now, in the, in the 50s and early 60s, there were no social movements to speak of, or hardly any. And you could, uh, so these movements that emerged in the new left are actually a great advance over the conditions that preceded them when the communist parties were defeated and uh, essentially disappeared in the United States uh, and in many other countries like Germany. Um, so <laughs> I guess my, my feeling was that there's something unhistorical about viewing the new left in the light of its failure to accomplish something that was really not in the cards. Marcuse knew this. He told us. He said, you know, this is not the revolution. You're not making the revolution. What are you doing then? Well, you are moving history as you can in such a difficult period. And some of that movement is enormous. I mean, if, if this were 1955, there would be no women in this room. So, I mean, there are huge changes that have taken place. Uh, and those changes are largely due to the new left and to other social, similar social movements. So you, you, in a period when there is no real possibility of overthrowing this, the, the state and the capitalist system, you move where you can. And that's, I think, is the, the, that's what was happening with the new left. That's why Marcuse was so enthusiastic about it. Um, but it's quite different from the logic of the actuality of the revolution that was inspiring Lukács in 1923 or 1924. Yeah, I, um, my, I, I take it that capitalism changes all the time. It's a moving target. Right. Uh, it doesn't sit still to be shot at. Uh, so we win things. We don't, it, 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 the, the trouble with the concept of the administered world is that it was excessively over-determinist. It assumed that capital routinely controls too much. Mm -hmm. And conversely, when Trotsky says that the revolution is the forcible entry of the masses on the political stage, <coughs> that was a misconception because the masses in, in, uh, in the uh, liberal states, the masses have a licensed place on the political stage, both in the form of being able to vote every so often and in the form of being allowed to do protest movements because we go back to the protest movement, the enormous protest movement against uh, the slave trade in the late, later 18th century. Um, and uh, I've been reading about the guys who... Um, uh, broke turnpikes, broke down locks, um, uh, uh, precursors of Luddism in the uh, and the legis enormous amount of legislation directed against forms of collective action through the 18th century. You know, so the, this uh, this is that there is struggle is normal. That the capitalists get caught out by struggles. Uh, is, and have to make concessions of one sort and another to them is also normal. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I, I, uh, again, an English thing, uh, the prison officers went on strike. Completely illegal. Uh, they had no right to go on strike. Uh, but they did it, uh, sub rosa, quiet communication under the using social media, they communicated together, and they went on strike, and the government hadn't got any troops to send in to take over the jails because they were in Iraq. Um, and they had to capitulate. Now, okay, the prison office is not going to win that again because the government has introduced surveillance mechanisms for the social media. Say, that's old. That's old stuff, yeah. So this, 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 we live in a world in which it is not the case that everything is absolutely administered. We do not live in a dystopia. We do not live in 1984 or Brave New World, yeah. Uh, we live in a world which is contradictory and in which there is ongoing struggle how to get out of the continued dominance of capitalism, which is dominance of capitalism, we need to be able to convert that 
world in which there are struggles and openings and opportunities for struggles into the sort of broad mass movement which thinks we want to organise in the long term to tie all these different struggles together but also to engage in the political question of how we overthrow this state regime uh, and that we do so with the aim of this is what they called the maximum program, the general aim of getting wholly beyond capitalism. So I just want to make a plea for Lukács uh, to conclude, um, which is to say, again, the relevance and irrelevance of Lukács, if he belongs to a moment, a hundred years old or more, of um, proletarian socialism trying to get beyond capitalism. The question is, what is capitalism? So one thing that we can say about the 60s new left, the new social movements, is that uh, they actually did, A, have a kind of utopian direction to them, and B, an attempt to sort of grasp the totality. And so the, the currency of a concept like reification from Lukács is that actually you could redefine what the problem of capitalism was. In other words, to... to grasp again in a new way, the way the old Marxists had indeed already grasped, and certainly Marx and Engels had grasped themselves, um, capitalism is not just an economic system. In other words, the, the economic problem of capitalism is w one aspect of it. So political economy is not economics, it's much more of a kind of a social question uh, more broadly. Now, since then, since the 60s, and this is where, Ed, your question kind of came in, um, what we can see is the continued like change of capitalism, the continued operation of reification, but without being seen as such, right? So to call capitalism white supremacy or patriarchy or misogyny actually does obscure the nature of the totality, or to call it uh, colonialism, right? Uh, decolonize the curriculum, right? Um, so. Uh, Right. Um, <laughs> uh, no, no, I was asked, how are you going to decolonize the curriculum? I said, I don't know how to decolonize Benjamin and Adorno. <laughs> right? Uh, I guess they were Jews who colonized Europe. Oh, oh no. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay. Um, I talk, talk about romantic anti capitalism. Uh, you might as well go to the source, you might as well go straight to the, the real romantic anti capitalists, the Nazis. Um, no, but in all seriousness, that uh, we do have the problem recurring. I'm also uh, remembering something that Adorno said about the student movement in 1969. Namely, that the students are revolting against bureaucratization, but in such a way as to further the bureaucratization of the university. And certainly that is true. And we're definitely seeing that uh, uh, kind of come to an outer limit, talk about an outer limit of reification today. Um, so the question is, again, if we were to recast, you know, so there are liabilities, clearly, but there are also advantages to saying, okay, it's not capitalism, if by that we mean an economic system, but it's reification. It's a means ends reversal, it's capitalism. Capital is not a, something that we use, but something that seems to dominate us, even as we use it. Um, I'm also r recalling, you know, this is the Lucian Goldman point with respect to Heidegger. Um, you could say that Heidegger's critique of technology, which the postmodernists um, took up, everything became a technology of this, a technology of that, um, that that's a way of recasting capitalism too, right? To say um, that uh, we are kind of dominated by the tool that we think we're using or instrumental reason in that respect that we think that we're using reason as our instrument, but we become dominated by it. Um, there are obvious liabilities to that because it kind of makes the political problem more fuzzy, but there's also an advantage to it, which is that it actually does encompass the sense of what's wrong with the world, right? Um, and so, you know, I would say that the 60s did try to grasp capitalism at a deeper level. The misfire being that it generated its own kind of means-ends reversal where the phenomenal forms of capitalism then became 
in a sense, the thing, rather than um, what the earlier Marxism grasped, which was a dynamic of change, a dynamic of change that we participate in and that comes to dominate us, rather than getting confused for the phenomena, the manifest phenomena of the process of change. Um, and unfortunately, we still live in the shadow of the 60s, the new social movements. In other words, the new social movements sought to go beyond uh, a rather what they considered to be a rather kind of superficial critique of capitalism, but then they substituted something else for capitalism. Um, and we are seeing that play out today. Um, now, the millennial left did have its moment. It did have its socialist moment. It did. Not sure what's become of it exactly. Right, the Democratic Socialists of America, that moment, you know, has it been fully subsumed um, in the next wave of reification? Uh, I think so, to a large extent, but that's not an easy story to tell. That's not a story that we can tell quite yet the way we can sort of talk about the new social movements creating new forms of reification. Um, but Lukács at least raises this question. The advantage of the old Marxism was that uh, it, it actually did seek a social revolution, not just a kind of uh, a complaint against exploitation. Unfortunately, that is what Marxism subsequently came to mean. It came to mean the importance of class, the importance of class exploitation, the importance of the economic question. And what was lost was what the earlier Marxists called the social question. Um, I think that Norman Finkelstein mentioned this in his book talk. He said, oh, we used to say class was the social question. And I thought, oh, but actually the social question is not meant to be like reducible to just class. In fact, class is supposed to be an expression of it. Um, so that would still be the point of Lukács. That would be, in other words, that Lukács at least poses the question. And I think that he even says in the preface to history and class consciousness, that um, the purpose of his studies is not to answer, but to raise the questions, right? 